know that we're all in this together, you know, and, and uh, the thing that really was strong in me today, and I want to encourage you, never live by your emotions because it just, it won't work out. Don't go by your feelings, you know. Hey, I'm feeling biblical today. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm feeling really good. All the stars have lined up, and I'm going to read Proverbs. You know, what the Lord is showing me, and, and there's many examples in the Bible, you can all see this. Whenever you take an action towards the things of God, he returns it with an action or a response. I'll just give you two examples out of the Bible. When they were going to go into the promised land, they had the Jordan River to contend with, and the waters were really high at that time because of the, you know, we got the early and latter rains. And so what had to happen in order for everyone to cross over the Jordan River just like he did it bringing them out of Egypt. He had to do the same thing when he wants to bring them into the promise. He'll do the same thing. He'll separate the waters. Well, what happened is the waters didn't separate until the priests put their feet in the Jordan River. Once they took that action, there was a great opening. And it actually tells you the location of from one end to the next how wide that was for them to cross over. But they had to literally put their, put their feet in the water in the land of Israel, in the Jordan River, for the waters to separate. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's a woman in the Bible who had an issue of blood. I think it was 12 years or was it 18 years? A number of years, she had this issue of blood. She was constantly bleeding. 12 years, amen. How I many? that's a long time to have something like that, especially in a state of uncleanness now. So what did she do? She reached out and grabbed the hem of the garment of Yeshua, the zitzitz, the fringes. She grabbed the, the zitzitz. You know, in the, in the Greek, they don't have any words for fringes or zitzitz in the Greek. So they use the word hem, the hem of his garment, you know. And, uh, and so once again, she was healed. And so what's happening now, I can't encourage all of you enough that you might be going through something, things are happening in your life, but press in and, make, and take the right action. Okay, because it's so important. So what I basically want to do is I want to share with you the celebrating the Feast of the Lord teaching. Uh, this is just a little uh, review on, on the feast day, starting with, of course, Passover or Pesach. Uh, one of the things I discovered about the Hebrews of the Christian faith and continuing in my own faith as a Christian is that uh, practicing, once again, the Hebrews of the Christian faith, it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of action. How many are talking about how many of that when you practice the Hebrews of the Christian faith, you're not bored? You're just not, because there's always a Torah portion, there's a Shabbat, there's, a, there's the Teshuvah, there's the feast days. And, and so that's why, you know, uh, I was always teasing uh, a lot of people about being advanced Christians. It's not that you're better than anybody else. It's just that you want more. You want to be able to do more, amen, as we model ourselves after the first century church. So I'm going to share with you uh, celebrating the Feast of the Lord teaching. I'm going to share this with you. My 24 years of experience, I've put this together. I really want to encourage you and make you think about some things, you know, because like I said, uh, it's very cyclical in what we're doing here at Beit Tehillah. Like God is, is cyclical. And so we're, we're on this spiral going up. You know, it's the same revolution of a circle and going in a 360 degrees or going up, but we're ascending. We're going up to greater heights with the Lord. Amen. So right out of the gate, let me just share this. You know, isn't it funny how most of us are first generation feast keepers? Our parents didn't do it. Our grandparents didn't do it. Amen. And now all of a sudden, we are, of course, celebrating the feast of the Lord. Now in Hosea, I don't have a slide for this. But in Hosea 2.11, it says, I will also cause all her mirth to cease her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. So when I celebrated the Feast of Pesach or Passover in the spring of 1995, it changed my life. I'm like, oy vey, wow, it changed my life. You know, and so God is actually restoring all these things back to us. So we know that that's a sign right there of the restitution of all things spoken of in the book of Acts. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So the feasts were taken away, but now they've been given back. You know, and I would liken my life to a sacrifice. You know, when I come to the services, I don't always bring my A game. Sometimes I'm having, you know, 
personal issues or my thoughts are just full up there and all kinds of, but, but I'll, I'm going to tell you something. But I want to bring God my best. If I'm doing the men's meeting, if I'm coming to prayer, I'm always thinking, Lord, I want to bring you an offering. Now I'm coming in here and I'm a little beat up. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. But man, I want to give you my best because this is my offering unto the Lord, right? Like a sacrifice of praise. You could just sit in here and slouch down and do a service and get through it. But who wants to do that when he's looking for a sacrifice? He's looking for something from you personally that he can receive, amen? So keep that in mind. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2. We got quite a bit to cover here. We're going to hit all these feasts and, and, be, and be changed, amen? Uh, this is like a pep rally. Let's read the public reading of scriptures together. Speak unto the children of Israel. And say unto them, concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? Well, let's, let's break this down. The process for celebrating the feast, let's break it down. Here we go. Number one, speak to the sons of Israel. Right? Or daughters. Number two, the Lord's appointed times. Number three, proclaim. And number four, we have a holy convocations. Does everybody see that? I know this might seem redundant or whatever, but we just got to get focused on what's at hand. You know, Beit Tehillah was founded on many cool things. We just got to get back to the basics of our faith in the Hebrews of the Christian faith. You know, so many of you are spread out so thin and this and that, studying this book and that teaching and that. That's, that's fine. You can be a freelancer, but don't be a renegade. Here's the thing. We have to concentrate on where we're at today. We're in Teshuvah. We're on the Daniel fast. We're approaching Yom Teruah. You see what I'm saying? Don't get all wishy-washy on me now. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You've got to get laser focus, okay, because it's easy to be unfocused. So we have this, and it's interesting, too, because he's, he's speaking to the sons and daughters. It says to the children. I'll have to fix that slide. But it, it's speaking to the children of Israel. Are there any Israelites in this house? Anybody grafted in? Okay, good. Two of you. I'm going to keep going because all I need is two or three witnesses. And it's just the way it is, folks. We, we got to call a spade a spade. You know what I'm saying? The fireman's a fireman. The milkman's the milkman. You know what I'm saying? An Israelite is an Israelite. The Lord's appointed times, how I many they're not Jewish feasts? They're the Lord's feasts. Can Gentiles celebrate them? Absolutely. Why not? And that's the phenomenon that's happening even now. Uh, also, you are to proclaim. It means to publish, drop flyers, put up posters, to proclaim, you know. And, of course, we have holy convocations there as well. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if I have that or not. That's all right. All right, let's move on. The seven feasts of the Lord. Here they are. Number one is Passover. In Hebrew, it's Pesach. Then we have number two, unleavened bread. In the Hebrew, it's Hag Hamatzah. Number three is first fruits, Bikarim. And number four is Pentecost or Shavuot, also known as the Feast of Weeks, trying to use some terms that you would be familiar with. Those are the spring feasts. Everybody see that. Now, Yeshua fulfilled those spring feasts. We know it. In reflection, we can look at it. We know that he actually fulfilled those spring feasts. And now we're moving forward to the fall feasts. We have, of course, number five is trumpets. Yom Teruah. Number six, Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Number seven is tabernacles or Sukkot. Somebody see that. Also, number five is trumpets. Uh, in the Hallmark calendar, it's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. What's a Rosh Hashanah? What are we Roshan about? What's this Rosh? Rosh Hashanah. Now, there is something inside of us that wants to celebrate something. God is not a party pooper. He loves to party all the time. He knows how to throw a party. Okay, he likes to have a good time. And so, once again, there's something inside of us that wants to celebrate something. You know, I'm starting this little series in my mind. I'm going to put it down on paper and, and, and develop it. And the, the theme is going to be, there's a better way. 
Would you all agree? Have you ever been doing something a certain way and you find out there's a better way? And that's the way God is. We think, well, gosh, if I'm going to give this up, then why do I want, I don't want something else I don't like. God only has the best. That's why from the pulpit, I can, I can teach about the feasts and the, and the Sabbath and everything. And I don't have to get into why the pagan holidays are pagan. Why should I? I've only got this amount of time to preach truth, right? So there's a better way. There's a better way. Okay, let's move on here. This is very important. The feast days, including the Sabbath, show all of mankind two things. Two things. It's very important that you understand this. Number one, man has divine appointments to meet with his creator, right? Man has divine appointments to meet with his creator. Number two, they show the redemptive plan of the creator for all of mankind. Isn't that the coolest thing? You know, in the book of Leviticus, it's broken up into two sections. Part one is chapters 1 through 17, is the way to God. As you study the book of Leviticus, it is the meat of Torah. There's two books to the left and two books to the right. It's the meat of Torah. Amen. Leviticus is my favorite book. Did you know that? It is. I mean, it really is. If I had to pick one book, I'd pick Leviticus. It's got everything you need. Boom, boom, boom. The sacrifices, everything. Now, the interesting thing is part two of Leviticus Chapters 18 to 27 is the walk with God. Would you all agree? Okay, so if we reflect on some of the points that are made in the book of Leviticus, you know, the way to God is very interesting. So which, or which chapter has the dietary laws? Leviticus 11, right? So that's before 18, right? So that would be what? The way to God. God tells us what to eat, what not to eat. How many know what I'm talking about? It's just that simple. I'm not going to get into two kitchens and kosher and all that. I'm just saying basic dietary laws, amen. And they've already proven it scientifically. I'm not going to get into it, why you shouldn't eat those things. But once again, but now we're in the feasts. What chapter are the feasts in? They're in chapter 23. So that would be what? The walk with God. It's the walk with God. See, we're walking with God. Isn't that the coolest thing? All right, let's see here. All right, let's go into, uh, well, you know, just going back to this, you know, I don't have time to get into it right now, but there's also a teaching that I have done you can find on our YouTube channel called the Three National Feasts. Uh, And and so there, of course, Pesach, uh, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. But what I want to share about that is that you know, there's some incredible things that are happening, but if you, if you break it down, those three national feast days, actually, uh, we are closing in on the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Tabernacles. We are actually closing on the final, you know, redemptive plan of God, you know, and you were born for such a time as this. So once again, here are the spring feasts again. We're moving forward. Uh, we have, of course, once again, uh, we have Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost, also known as Feast of Weeks. Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks. So here we have those spring feasts. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, let's go right into it. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. Let's read it. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Does everybody see that? Very good. So here we have the Lord's Passover. Right out of the gate, we have the feast of Passover. It's also symbolic of being born again to be born again. Reflecting on Passover as the first national feast day, uh, we can honestly say that the children of Israel applied the blood of the lamb to their doorposts and the death angel passed over. Would you all agree? And if they didn't, he would take the firstborn. Why? Because he can. The firstborn belong to God. Are there any firstborns in the house? You have a lot of responsibility, you know, you have a lot of responsibility. The firstborn is supposed to carry on the name and the traditions and be the example of the family, and then it flows down. How many know in some cases the youngest was chosen? Like a Moses, amen. And, 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 and so uh, even like Joseph, he was further down the line. But, you know, God will use whoever he needs to use in that, in that line of, of, of progression as far as siblings go, but he wants the firstborn. 
Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, if you even go back and look at um, Moses and his two siblings, Aaron and Miriam, Miriam was the firstborn, Aaron was the middle child, Moses was the youngest. Very interesting, isn't it? So once again, we have Passover here. And of course, even in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, we're told, let's read it. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Does everybody see that? The church of Corinth was told to keep the Passover. What if Paul wrote a letter to Bell Shoals Baptist Church? Would he tell them to keep the feast? Amen, he would. What about Nativity Catholic Church? Absolutely. So why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we keep the feast? So once again, we can honestly say, as far as this, and I'm just going to throw this in here, this National Feast Day, how many of that, it's been fulfilled and is being fulfilled? Because Passover means what? It's about, it's about putting the blood on the, on, the, on the doorposts, right? It's about Yeshua uh, and all of that. So, so it's already in there in, in this particular verse that Yeshua is the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. You all would agree, right? Because I don't want to have a whole bunch of slides, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to you about this, and you know it. You know it already. So we know that the children of Israel came out of Egypt. We know that Yeshua is the Lamb, and we're re reflecting on 2,000 years, and people are being born again every day. How many of you would agree with that? So one-third of God's redemptive plan has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled. Let's move on, and let's look at the next feast day. Unleavened bread, Leviticus 23, 6. Let's read it. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Lord seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. You see that? Un unto the Lord. So seven days you must eat unleavened bread. You're commanded to eat unleavened bread. It's not like, well, I'm not eating the puffy bread. Or I'm not going to have any bread today. We're actually commanded to eat it as a symbolic gesture, as to know that they didn't have enough time for the leaven, right, to be raised in the bread, and they had to flee. How many know what I'm talking about? We know leaven is a picture of sin. What's interesting about this period of time, it's, it's seven days, which, of course, seven means completion. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Seven means completion. So you get born again. You get born again in that experience. In that day, it's one day event. And then we go into these seven days of getting the leaven out. How many of you know that's your life? How many of you are still getting the leaven out? Okay, good. 20 of you. I'm just saying it, it's, it's a battle. Amen. It's a battle. So uh, once again, symbolic of the process of getting the sin out of our life. Seven means completion. And so we have that. Now let's go over to 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Let's read it. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Well, he's just interpreting the scriptures, isn't he? He's just pointing it out to the church of Corinth. How many know what I'm talking about? So the Apostle Paul likens the church of Corinth to unleavened bread. He thinks highly of them. He believes in them. He said, this is a picture of you, amen? How many know what I'm talking about? It's kind of funny, too, because, you know, a lot of times we don't think very highly of ourselves. Some of you might have low self-esteem. How many of you battle low self-esteem? You don't have to raise your hand. You battle low self-esteem. And, and I'm even learning in my own uh, time of life that, you know, God loves me and I'm good enough. And that's what we need to know. You know, we, we always feel like, well, I don't measure up and this and that, but it's not the point. It's recognizing who he is, not who we are. It's who he is and what he wants to be through us. You know, this morning I was even praying, Lord, when I'm weak, you're strong. Lord, when I'm weak, you are strong. Amen. And so I, I, I love this part of it, you know. It, it kind of reminds me in, ref, in re, reflecting on Gideon. Do you remember Gideon, what he was doing when the angel of the Lord came to him? Basically, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He was in the wine press threshing wheat. They're not going to find me in here at this time of year. And the, and the angel of the Lord comes and calls him this mighty man of God. He's a coward. He's hiding, you know. They were playing hide and seek and Gideon lost. Found you. So just think about that. Little stories like that will build your faith. Well, hey, if Gideon was trying to get away with something and hiding and, you know, maybe wasn't quite cutting, that's me, right? Amen? You know, for, for years, I just, I went to the Lord and I'm like, 
Lord, I can't wait for you to raise up these people and you're going to bring the two houses together. We're going to see the restoration, regathering of the whole house of Israel. We're going to see incredible redemption and restoration. All, I just can't wait, Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to get under those men, and that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to just, I can't wait, you know. And, and I'm just waiting, waiting. And then one day, the Lord's like, it's you. I picked you. Said, no, 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 come on. I'm married with seven kids. I can't do this. I got a church. He goes, no, I'm going to put my message in you, and it's going to go all over the world. And you're going to build a strong community and raise up the next generation. And I'm going to use you. You just tell the people what I told you. I've lost a lot of people because of it. But I fear God. And I love his truth. And I'm not trying to take this truth and put it on you and make you do what I'm doing. Matter of fact, if you're not doing it, I get more from you. Because you didn't do it. I get your share. So quit on it. Walk out. Get out while you can. You know what I mean? Right? You guys ever heard that story? About those people that were worshiping in a third world country? Terrorists came in with guns and masks and started shooting up, you know, and come in there and just raised all kinds of cane. Says, you want to get out? Get out now. A lot of people left. The ones that stayed, they took the masks off put their guns down, says, now we can have church. Let me help all of you. This world is so full of comparisons and, and Greek mindset of, you know, fighting one another and I'll beat you and you beat me. And you're fighting against yourself, folks. Your battle is with yourself. It's not with my wife, my kids, or you. At the end of the day, when I'm laying in bed, I'm battling myself. And so what I'm sharing with you, this message, is that there is an inheritance for you, a promise, epigelia, a divine assurance of good. And if you want it, you will make changes, and you will be changed, and you will pursue it at any cost. And for those of you that have gone to High Yovel and seen what they've given up, see how they live, they're happier than all of us put together. Why? Because they're right where they need to be and they have purpose. Because they're fulfilling prophecies. See, there's the reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles happening right now on the earth. And you get to be a part of it if you want. Or you can be skeptical or cynical or whatever you want to be. Or negative. That's fine. Back away and practice your faith in another way then. But the way I see it, the whole house of Israel is made up of Jews and non-Jews. And if we don't have Jews in our life, we're not being restored. It's that simple. I'm not giving up my faith. I pray in Jesus' name. He's my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus is God. God is Jesus. I hold to the Christian doctrines, but I know I have an inheritance. I know I'm grafted in. And I know that Yeshua is the root of that olive tree. Whether the Jews accept him or not, he is the root of the olive tree. He's the Mashiach. He's the Messiah. Does everybody understand that? Let me move on. We've done Passover. We've done unleavened bread. What about first fruits in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 11? Let's check out first fruits. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. The firstfruits, how many know what I'm talking about? And when is it waved? The day after the Sabbath. So Saturday night to Sunday night, it's, it's, the first fruits is waved. Everybody see that? Now check out 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now, let's read this. Let's read it together now. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Is that the coolest thing? By the way, I, I, I didn't have the slide, but Holy Convocations is a mikra, M-I-Q-R-A. You could just mess with people. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to a mikra. The other guy's like, I'm going to the Copacabana. What's the Mikra? It means a rehearsal, public assembly. Amen? See, we don't fulfill anything. We're just obedient. He's going to fulfill it. Does everybody understand that? So here, here we have scriptures interpreting scriptures. So first, they actually say, Eddie Chunney was saying, if you go back and do the 
timeline that they would have crossed the Red Sea for first fruits. Very interesting, isn't it? Let's continue on now because we have Leviticus 23, 15. The counting of the Omer. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Does anybody see that? So wherever the Sabbath falls, we start counting that Saturday night, seven Sabbaths. So here's, here's the, the formula that we use here, not saying that other people are wrong or that we're right or we're wrong, but this is what we practice so there's no confusion. We basically do it this way, okay? Seven Sabbaths, Pentecost or Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, will always be on a Saturday night to Sunday night. Because if you count seven Sabbaths, 50, ah, ah, ah. Any homeschoolers in the room? They're loving life right now. It's going to be Saturday. Does everybody understand that? Now, I don't need to hear all these other teachings, and that's fine, because this is what we're going to do. We're never saying that we're right and they're wrong, but this is what we're going to do, and there's no confusion. And guess what? If we're wrong, Yeshua will help us. He'll fix it. You know, can you imagine that? Yeshua, this is the way we did it at Beit Tehillah, you know, and you're, you just want to change it? You just, this is all I know. You know, we're creatures of habit, you know. We drink the same drinks. We drive the same way to work. We're just creatures of habit. And I know that when, when all of us got our Hebrews, it just messed us up, didn't it? We're just like, what happened, man? Like, I, I used to watch cartoons on Saturday. Now I got to go to church. I got to move on because we're not going to get done. But we will. So we're moving towards what? Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Leviticus 23, 16. Let's read it. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. You've got to count up to 50. How many of you are doing? You're counting up to 50. And I love the Daniel fast because it's only 21 days. You know what I'm talking about? Yesterday I was over in the fellowship hall. It was so funny being on the Daniel fast, you know, and I, I, I passed by this rack here, and there was this, this coffee. That's all I could say. It was coffee in a bag with beans in it. I kid you not. And I just walked by, and I went, this, this leg went like this. And I, I was doing like, I was like, and I went like this. And I went, oh. And I, I actually, I got the coffee bag, and I opened it up, and I went, oh. Oh, I just took a hit, right? No, 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 it messed me up. I think I got a buzz off that. I don't know, something. I was having a good day after that. That's terrible, isn't it? Is smelling a sin? <laughs> Thou shalt not smell coffee. I'm just saying I'm being real. I only got seven more days I can do it. Oh, and that breeze starts picking up like outside. That's coffee weather, you know what I'm saying? A few little clouds roll in. Oh, the clouds and the wind. Uh, uh, uh. All right, moving on. Can't go down a bunny trail because we don't believe in that anymore, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. No, I gave him up. That, that, that rabbit has nothing to do with Jesus. All right. Now, the Feast of Pentecost is not only the celebration of the giving of the Torah, but the Holy Spirit as well. Exodus 19 and 20, and then Acts 2. I'm just paraphrasing here, just throwing it together for you to make you think. Oh, and by the way, anybody that wants these PowerPoints, just contact Kathy. She will email them to you. Amen. So those are two glorious events, are they not? Did I share with you about the three national feast days? Okay, are you with me now? I'm telling you, when you get this, you'll be like, oh my gosh, we're running out of time. So would you agree that Pentecost or Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled? Would you agree? Come on, somebody. This is like a stop sign. How many of you know a stop sign is a big deal? How many of you people have died because people thought it was funny to, to move a stop sign? So you are, listen, all of you are, this is what the Lord is telling me, you're a sign in the earth, tell everybody what I'm telling you. Do you know that I've been free to roam about the country? 
I'm free. I'm free to share. I'm free to share this message with anybody, anytime, anywhere. He said, you're free to roam about the country. Go, tell them all. Remember when Esther was told, don't tell anybody who you are. Those days are over, folks. You better start telling people who you are. Bahamas just got wiped out. You know, the islands wait for the Torah, man. That devastation in Irma went straight up, up Florida because why? There's a big pocket of people in Florida that are studying Torah, right? ICTS with, with Simcha Torah, Bateman, Rosh, have all these Torah academies and Torah schools, right? Because now these storms are coming and Irma went straight up Florida, man. Messed me up. I don't like September. I had kicked out of my house in last September. I don't like September. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. The storm came. September. But then my son's like, but Father, that's my birthday. <laughs> Let me just get through the month and we'll celebrate it in October. <laughs> How many know what we're talking about? I'm sorry, but I'm telling you, I got to get through this month. So now two-thirds of God's redemptive plan has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled. You need to get this. No one's teaching this. I've looked all over the internet. I've looked this. No one teaches the three national feast days show the redemptive plan of God. Because I was like thrown off by like, well, there's eight feast days, but the three national feast days are major. Amen. So are, are people getting Torah today? Are people being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit moving over the world? Listen, there's only one Holy Spirit, everyone. And if it's not the Holy Spirit, all of you have another spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. You can have familiar spirits and all kinds of spirits, but there's only one Holy Spirit. And that's what we're always striving to do. That's why when David fell, what did he say in the Psalms, in his song? When he fell with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah the Hittite, you know what he said? He said, renew a right spirit within me. You know what that was in the Hebrew? He was saying, Lord, give me a constant spirit. Because you'll have the Holy Spirit for a while, then whoosh, another spirit comes in. Do the Holy Spirit for a little while, then whoosh, another spirit comes in. He said, renew a right spirit. Renew a constant spirit within me. So I don't reflect those other spirits. I don't want those other spirits. Amen? So isn't that cool? That's 2,000 years ago. So now we're moving towards the final one-third. But, but once again... In between the spring feasts and the fall feast is the season of summer, amen? Oh, boy, it's going to get hot. Here we go. Proverbs 10, 5. Let's read it. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. The summer months should be your most active months, spiritually speaking. You should be going to church. You should be reading the Torah. You should be getting into it, amen? You should be active. You should be really, really active. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. How many that right now we're in the harvest season? Right? Moving on here. Events in Israel that happened in the summer months. Events in Israel that happened in the summer months. Here we go. The first one was the golden calf incident on Tammuz 17, Exodus 32. How many of you know that was a bad situation? We're still paying for it today. Matter of fact, that's why we have the Day of Atonement today is because of that, the golden calf incident. In that particular incident, it was very interesting that idolatry became what? Sexual immorality. See, whenever you have idolatry, you're going to find sexual immorality. So in that particular case, with the golden calf incident, as they were worshiping the golden calf, it evolved into sexual immorality. Uh, the ten spies give an evil report, Numbers 13, chapter 13 of Numbers. Ten spies give an evil report. How many of you know that it said it was the time of the first ripe grapes? Or Carolyn was saying the grapes are just popping and oozing. Isn't that cool? How many people can say they picked grapes in Israel? Only a handful of people. I knew when I, was, I should have picked them. I just looked at them. Man. Man. I think one time I was on the bus, I drove by the vineyard. <laughs> Both temples were destroyed on the ninth of Av. I mean, these are all events in the summertime. I mean, these are cataclysmic. These are very, very profound events. How I many know what I'm talking about? And by the way, those 10 spies that gave an evil report, they died of a plague. So keep giving an evil report, folks, because you're going to die. I'm going towards the inheritance. So it doesn't matter what happens around me. I want my inheritance. 
So guess what happens? The closer I get to my inheritance, the more I die. Amen? Let's do another summer verse in Proverbs 30, 25. Let's do this. The answer are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Amen? Does everybody see that? So we've been preparing and doing things here all summer in the office and everything. We've been preparing and doing things, putting things together. Also, from 2001 to 2010, we held a conference every summer teaching the Hebrews of the Christian faith in the summertime. How many of you attended the conferences? For 10 years. The restoration of the, what? The Tabernacle of David. That's a whole other teaching in and of itself. It's very interesting, you know. Uh, the Tabernacle of David had the, had the Ark of the Covenant out in the open, and people could surround it with the priests. And you actually had access to God. There was, no, there was no tent. How many of you know what I'm talking about? God's not going to restore the Mosaic Tabernacle or Moses Tabernacle. He's going to restore the fallen booth of David and give access to the Jews and the non-Jews. How many know what I'm talking about? This is found in Amos, and it's also found in the book of Acts. See, when, when, when Peter had to go to the Gentiles and, and all this, that was a big, that was taboo. But God's like, no, this is my plan. Remember when the sheet came down, we think it's about food. No, it's about people. God said, call no man unclean. Right? Call no man unclean. Man, is this good or what? So we're going to get through the summer months. As a matter of fact, September 23rd is the first uh, day of fall, amen. I'm so looking forward to the cool, the cool weather. It's going to be 90 instead of 100. I'm telling you right now, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe you aren't. I'm looking forward to 90 degrees. I'm, you know, just saying. I got to move on here. I think I bit off more than I can chew. Okay, season of Teshuvah. Woohoo! Elul 1 to Tishri 10, September 1st to October the 9th. It ends at sundown on the day of Yom Kippur. On Yom Teruah, the gates are open. Day of Atonement, the gates are going to close. We call that the Nila service. We're going to talk about that. Of course, we have the Daniel fast from Elul 1 to Elul 21. It fits properly into this Gregorian calendar of September 1st to the 21st. Amen. So check that out. And let me just share this with you. I believe what we have at Beit Tehillah is a model even for the present-day church to use. Amen. I would say. And I'm not saying that, you know, they have to change from, from Sunday to Saturday. But what I am saying is that just like the Teshuvah spiritual planner, you know, God had, had given that to me and shown me the revelation of what the Jews have been practicing for thousands of years. Amen? We think we can't learn from the Jewish people. Are you kidding me? Of course we can learn from the Jewish people. You can learn a lot from the Jewish people. Amen? Let's move on. Okay, the fall feasts. We have trumpets, which is Yom Teruah. The Day of Atonement, or Atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, and then we have, of course, Tabernacles, which is Sukkot. Does everybody see that? So in two weeks, in one day, we're going to kick off the fall feasts. Whew. Wow. Let's look at Leviticus 23, 24. Trumpets. Let's read it. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath and memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Does everybody see that? This is the most mysterious of the feast days, is Yom Teruah. So you are to what? Come together as a holy convocation, which is a rehearsal and assembly, and you are to blow the trumpets. Do you see what I'm saying? It's that simple. Now, do you believe we have a picture? This man is wanted in all over the world. For stirring it up, blowing the trumpet. Think about it, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have shofars. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, the picture on your program is actually Bill Carter in Washington, D.C. on the day of trumpets, Yom Teruah, literally. Okay. And so he blew the trumpet, and then the Washington, D.C. police and the government arrested him. <laughs> Almost. What year was that when you guys went? Do you want to go ask him real quick and come back? Can you let her in the side door? I'll wait. <laughs> you see that picture? 
Now, it's like people say, that's Photoshopped. No. No. No, no, no. So let's, let's break down the Yom Teruah. Let's break it down. Break it down. You ready? Okay, it's what? Let's go to the next slide. It's a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Okay. Didn't we just have 9-11? Is that the 9-11 memorial? And so we're reflecting on when the two towers were struck by terrorists and lives were lost and the two towers went down in New York City. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's 9-11 memorial. So here this word is the crown. Memorial is the crown. It's uh, the Hebrew word is the crown. Uh, number 2146. It's a memento or memorable thing, day, or writing or a record. A record. A record. A memento or memorable thing, day, or writing. So how we have this blowing of trumpets, it's a memorial. So here's the question. There's two questions. What is the memorial? What are we to be reminded of? Good question, isn't it? God doesn't just do these things happenstance, coincidence. He doesn't just throw something together. It's all for a reason. It's all building up. You know what I'm saying? His redemptive plan is building up. For such a time as this, you were born. So in the law of first mention, we move on here. The first time that the shofar was blown can be found in Exodus 19.16. So the law of first mention means what, Pastor Nick? What does it mean? It means the first time that it's mentioned is the original purpose. Pretty cool, huh? You like that? The law first mentioned shows you the original purpose, the original meaning. Let's read Exodus 19, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. I mean, wow. The voice of the trumpet. Whose voice was that? God's voice. It wasn't Al Hurt reincarnated. No. No. Think about it. On the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. Do you see this is a meteorologist's dream? Do you see the, the, the atmosphere? Are we kind of seeing that? I don't know about you guys. I've lived in Florida pretty much all my life, except I was two years old. My, my mom and dad, and my brother and I, we, we we moved here from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, go Buckeyes! And so we we moved here. And I'm telling you, the last couple of years, the thunder and the lightning and the clouds. It's almost like I feel like God's speaking through nature. It's like this rumble, and he just I don't know. It's just and it seems closer. The lightning feels closer, you know. I got that app, you know, the Weather Channel app. You know, lightning just struck, you know, 1.2 miles from your house or whatever, you know. I mean, I've had times in my house where it said lightning struck zero, meaning it struck the backyard. Seriously. This thing really works. Like, it struck me. Now, can the feast day of Yom Teruah or the trumpets be a reminder of the marriage covenant that was made at Mount Sinai by the blowing of a trumpet? Good question, isn't it? Because we're, we're in this lull right now. We're, we're moving towards the fall feast because the spring feasts have been fulfilled. So let's move on. The feast day of Yom Teruah is also a celebration of the new moon or Rosh Kodesh because it falls in the seventh month Tishri on the first day. In the seventh month on the first day. Does everybody understand that? That's going to be... Two weeks from today, one day extra this Sunday, be the 29th, correct? So blowing of trumpets is teruah. It's the Hebrew word teruah for blowing of trumpets. It's number 8643 in the Strong's Concordance. It's, it's an acclamation of joy or a battle cry. Shout or shouting. Amen. Shout or shouting. Acclamation of joy or a battle cry. Now, the feast day of Yom Teruah is commonly known as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. It is the start of the civil year in the Hebrew calendar. This year is 5780, is that correct? Coming up. It's coming up. 
So we know there's a biblical new year, but this is the civil new year. How many know what I'm talking about? So what the Jews are saying, based upon the, the timeline of the Hebrew calendar, they're saying 5,780 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth and man and everything else. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Now, there's a lot of debate about old earth, new earth. I'm not going to get into that. But what I really see happening is, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've studied this out a little bit, they've not even measured or counted like 250 years because of a technicality. So what I would submit to you is that we're closer to 6,000 than we know. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And no man knows the day or the hour. We get into all that. But we know the season that we're in, do we not? So just think about that. That's very fascinating. So Yom Teruah meals often include apples and honey to symbolize a sweet new year. Yom Teruah meals often include apples and honey to symbolize a sweet new year. How many of that's not going to hurt you? I ain't doing that. That's under the law. I don't know what custom that is. I don't know. You give me apples and honey, I'm eating that. But this is what we do. You know, you guys probably would have failed humanities if you can't respect Judaism. I don't like humanities. Man, you're like, get a life, right? There's so much flavor in this church. Did you know there's flavor in this church? There's all kinds of flavors. It's like Baskin Robbins. Seriously, there's so many flavors in here. And it's the most awesome. I got all kinds of flavors at my house. You know, sometimes I wish I had chocolate and vanilla, but I got rainbow. I got, you know, whatever. I got all kinds of flavors. So there's the picture of the apples and honey. So that's, that's a tradition, and we're going to be doing that. Amen. Hope you're hungry. Now, once again, we went to the law of first mention. How many of you know that the Lord blew the trumpet over the people? Did he not? Well, let's look at Zechariah 9, 14. He's going to do it again. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as a lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. Come on, somebody. Now, that's the verse that kind of goes along, but that same, I, I, I'm just going to go there. I'm going to go there. I'm going to make you think about things. Thing you make you, things that make you go, hmm. Zechariah. All right, here we go. Zechariah chapter 9, right? Let me just tell you a couple things that are in that chapter. One is Yeshua coming in on a donkey in the city. Does that come to pass? Wow, that's cool. I believe that, Pastor Nick. I believe he came in on a donkey. Amen? Right? But let's keep reading the chapter. Okay, that's, that's in Zechariah 9, 9, but can, can we read chapter 9, verse 13? Can I read this to you? Would you like me to tell you a little story? Let me tell you a story. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. The next verse is this one. So what I want to submit to you is that Ephraim and Judah are coming together. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, there's nothing you can do about it. Because if he came in on the donkey, and what about Ephraim and Judah? You love Hawkeye, don't you? You love superheroes. Shoot those arrows. Look at that guy. He shaved his eyebrow off of that. He's so good. But I read this. Oh, believe it. Oh, I want you to donate your eyebrow over there. See if you can do it. No, man, I'm good. I believe Judah and Ephraim, bow and arrow. That's good. See, I get to share this. Now all of you are messed up. Can't take it back. Can't take it back. We don't edit at Big Tehillah. There's no editing. Can't take it back. Come on. Have you all just read your Bible and says, what's this all about? You, this, this, this was me. Lord, what's this? What's that? Who are these people? What's an Ephraim and what's a Judah? What is this? Now you got to start researching it, don't you? See, I just messed up your whole life. Good. Because my life's messed up too. Thank you, Abba. Right? Um, So the period between the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement is referred to as the 10 days of all. 10 days of all between September 29th 
in October 9th, you're going to see it. You're going to see the 10 days of all, which is a picture of what? We have this little diagram for you. Here it is. From Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur. It's also from September 30th to October the 9th. That's the actual day. Or Tishri 1 to Tishri 10. Does everybody see that? This is important. We're on God's calendar. I gave up my calendar 24 years ago. When the, when the feast came out, I put my calendar away. I'm doing your calendar, God. You know what I mean? It's so funny when the Daniel fast comes, it's so inconvenient. But that's my anniversary. That's my birthday. But that's boss's day, secretary day, boxer's day. That's a day. I'm, I'm going on vacation during the Daniel fast. Well, they get a Lara bar. Suck on some granola. What do you want? Chop up some apples. It's not my responsibility to make it convenient for you. Amen? Come on, somebody. The things of God are hard. If someone says, oh, God is so easy, the things of God are so easy, you ain't falling like my God. Because <laughs> it's not easy. You're battling your flesh and peer pressure and culture and all kinds of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I have to change to what he wants. He's not going to change to what I want. See, the calls are coming in right now. I'm telling you the truth. Trust me, I fight all the time. God, I want this. And I, he goes, just be quiet. Do what I told you to do. It always works out. <laughs> Some of you crack me up, you know, like, like you go to God. Father, you know, I love you and I, I, I want this. I need this. This is me. This is who I am. I've done this for years. It's, it's who I am. He's like... You're in sin. <laughs> Cut it out. Stop it. Or like when we're frustrated or something. You know, I shake my fist at God. I, I yell and scream. I do stuff, you know. I throw a tantrum right there on the first level of the kingdom of God, right there on the earth floor, you know. He just lets it, he, he just likes it. He goes, okay, you're all right. You're going to be okay, you know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. None of us go to God like this. Let's just, let's just quit pretending. You know, Father... Been married 20 years, got these seven kids, and I'm a little overwhelmed. You know, I'm just a little overwhelmed. And there's some things happening at the church and got some stuff going on. And, uh, you know, but you're, you're a cool cat. You're a cool guy. You're, you could do this thing. You're, you just, you know, you could just do this thing, you know. And, you know, I'm just uh, really frustrated. You know, I just don't want to do it anymore. You know, don't want to do any of it anymore. <laughs> but God's like, okay, you done? You feel better? All right. Write me a check for 60 bucks for that, <laughs> for that little session. <laughs> it's called a tithe <laughs> or an offering. But I'm only telling you, you guys got to be real with God. Listen, when I sin, I sin. I tell him exactly what the sin is. Lord, I did this. We don't even want to say it. Father, I sinned. No, tell him what the sin is. It is it's embarrassing. And sometimes we don't even want to say it. I did this and I did that. We don't want to even say it out of our mouth. But I've learned to humble myself and swallow my pride because you know what? That's what the sin is. You have to differentiate the sins. Like the white lie. Oh, it's got white in it. Right? That's just like, I've had people tell me, oh, I know they're in the occult, but they're, they're, they're a white witch. They're a good witch. No, suffer not a witch to live. You know what I'm saying? Like the black witch can die, the white witch can live. No, suffer not a witch to live. I mean, the, the case is solved. It's done. It's over. You know? So now we're going into atonement. Leviticus 23, 27, here we go. Also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Does everybody see that? So now we're at atonement. We're going to pick it up a little bit here. We're going to pick it up and move on here. So here we have atonement. This is where we get the 24-hour fast, not eating and drinking. And I've had so many people argue with it. It doesn't say I can't eat or drink. Listen, this is what you're supposed to do. You are to afflict your soul. There's nothing better than not drinking or eating. I'm going to do a juice fast. No. I'm going to fast TV. No, fasting is always about food and drink. You don't fast nothing. You just quit watching TV. You didn't fast it. Because fasting is always about food and beverages. Think about it. So Yom Kippur, names, themes, and idioms. Here we go. Let's look at this. Yom Kippur is also the day of atonement. It's face to face. It's the day or the great day. It's the fast. 
the great shofar, right? Shofar Haggadah. Or it's the Nila service, the closing of the gates. Remember the 10 days of all? The gates are open at Yom Teruah. The gates close at sundown, October 9th. So Kippur means ransom by means of a substitute. Kippur means ransom by means of a substitute. So here we look at the Day of Atonement. I'm going to break it down to you really simple. The two goats of Yom Kippur. Here we go. The two goats of Yom Kippur. So lots were cast by the high priest for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat, Azazel. That was the name of the what? The scapegoat, Azazel. This was the name uh, given to a, a chief demon or fallen angel in the book of Enoch. Very interesting observation. Parallels, okay? I'm just saying... Fallen angel, chief demon, Azazel, is found in the book of Enoch. So that was the scapegoat is Azazel. So here are the two goats continuing on. We're moving. We're moving in a good manner here. Number one, one goat is chosen to be sacrificed to purge the shrine of any similar defilement stimulated by misdeeds of the whole Israelite people. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. So how many? the one goat is for what? For the place. So what happened in the golden calf incident? They contaminated their camp, the place. Number two, the second goat is sent away, not sacrificed to cleanse the people themselves. The goat is marked as Azazel and is sent away into the wilderness. Does anybody see that? Leviticus 16.10. They've actually done some archaeological excavations and found this one particular cliff, and at the bottom are goat bones. So it's not like... Nah, nah. Go away, little goat. Go away, little goat. No, that goat is pushed off a cliff and dies. Amen? That's the way it is. So, very interesting, right? And where would the spirits not want to go but to a dry place? They would not want to go to a dry place. They want to be a host. They want to have a host. They want to, they want to come on in and be squatters and come into your life. And see, that's what we're all doing. We're getting rid of the squatters. Because they're just messing our lives up. And we're not able to achieve the inheritance because they're, they're squatters. There's no such thing as possession, demon possession. They don't possess anything. They're squatters. You have every right to get them out. Amen? Don't accept it. That's why I love uh, LL Ministries. So there you have your two goats. So the main purpose for Yom Kippur is for corporate forgiveness. Corporate forgiveness. That's what Yom Kippur is all about. We're moving on here. Leviticus 16.34, And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Amen. Does everybody see that? Some people say, well, if Yeshua was the Messiah, he would have died on the Day of Atonement. No, because he's not a goat. He's a lamb. So Yeshua is our high priest. I want to tie this in to the New Testament. Hebrews 2.17, let's read it. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Does anybody see that? He's the middleman. Amen? Reconciliation. Yeshua is our high priest. Continue on in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Oh, and by the way, chapter 10 is all about the Day of Atonement. It's got the flavor and the symbolism of the Day of Atonement. Let's read it. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, right? Continuing on. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Somebody see that? That's where you get the ceremonial law. That's where you get the mikvah. Does everybody see that? Why are we doing mikvahs? Listen, it's the same thing that they were doing with John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. They were doing mikvahs and repenting. Does everybody see that? They weren't baptized in the name of John. He was doing mikvahs in the Jordan River. And he was what? preparing the way for the Messiah. Do you see what God is doing? He's like, I want you to do mikvahs like John the Baptist, and you're preparing the way for my son to come back. 
See, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, you don't have to believe, because faith without works is dead. I believe in it. We started with like eight people in Pastor Tikva's pool. It's grown to like 80 to 100 people now. And if you feel the water calling you, come on down. We have information in the back. I've had my own experiences with, with, with a mikvah. If you had a good experience with mikvahs and it was life-changing, just raise your hand. See? Now, you're baptized only once in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the water will always call you. Mikvahs is something that's, that's ongoing. Amen? How many of you just squat down in the shower, let the water hit your back, and just say, Lord, forgive me, and let that water just hit you? I did this morning. It was powerful. Amen? And so we're doing mikvahs. Look at Leviticus 16.4. Look at that, what the high priest had to do. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Amen? Does everybody see that? Going to even Hebrews 10.25, where once again, we're talking about the Day of Atonement in context. Are you ready for this? You've probably heard this. Take it out of context. Let's read it. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's not every time the church doors are open, you're in the church. This is for a specific person, uh, purpose. Does everybody see that? Is that good? Remember, we're so far away from the first century church, we don't even know what the church looked like. As you see the day approaching, the Day of Atonement. It's in context, and of course we should be together because he is approaching. Leviticus 23, 34. We are at Tabernacles. We're going to finish up here, right? Tabernacles. Somebody wake up. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Amen. Does anybody see that? In the seventh month, on the 15th day of the seventh month. Oh, and by the way, it's a full moon. Pesach is a full moon. What is the moon a picture of? It doesn't give off its own light. It's a picture of us. Right? Full moon. Fully, fully restored, fully gathered. Pesach, you're fully redeemed, fully born again. I mean, you can't get more born again than being born again. You're born again, you're born again. And, and, and the best way I understand to be born again is the way I understood it, the way I experienced it. God's a spirit, and I have a spirit, and they met. And it had nothing to do with academia, had nothing to do with a guilty conscience, had nothing to do with just coming down the aisle because I don't want to go to hell. No, my spirit cried out to God, who is a spirit, and our spirit met. Boom! Because anybody's going to go down the aisle because they don't want to go to hell. That's not a born again experience. It's not. All right, the lulaf in Leviticus 23, 40. How many are familiar with the lulaf, the palm branches, and the, and, the, and the citron? Okay. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You're commanded to rejoice. Does everybody see that? This is the waving of the lulaf. And they would wave the lulaf because they were speaking the blessings over God that he would bring rain for their future crops. Amen. Now, Leviticus 23, 42, how about sukkahs? You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. So we see that. We had these booths out at the church and different things going on. Somebody was getting real smart with me, and they said, so I guess, uh, I guess you got to go sleep in that booth because that's what it says. You got to go sleep in that sukkah. So he's getting all smart with me. So I said, well, not really. I said, I'm not a... I'm not actually, uh, yeah, well, no, it says right here that our Israelites born. I wasn't born in Israel. People, they do stuff, you know. But it's, 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 it's something, to, it's a picture. Because he, he said, I'm going to have you to dwell in booths again. The Feast of Tabernacles should be celebrated today, amen. Leviticus 23, 41 and Colossians 2, 16. Let's read it. Let me say that again. The Feast of Tabernacles should be celebrated today, would you agree? Thank you, I, I can go on now. I just want to make sure. Let's read it. Leviticus 23, 41. 
And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Amen? Is that cool or what? I don't know if I have that or not in here. I don't think I did. Oh, well. I missed a couple slides in this. I'm going to fix it. It's a statute forever. What part of forever don't we understand? Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. See, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Did anybody understand that? Let Scriptures interpret Scriptures. So see, Paul was going in and teaching these Gentiles these things, and they were being criticized. Amen? You got to remember, Greek mythology was powerful. Zeus was the most powerful god known to the world. And the History Channel had a little special. Jesus, Yeshua, usurped Zeus as the greatest god in the world. He literally usurped him. That's why Greek mythology is trying to make a comeback, you know but it's not working. So sukkahs come in different styles and sizes. You guys have seen this before. For those of you that are new, this will be some nice little pictures for you. So sukkahs come in different styles and sizes. Here we have an, um, a sukkah because you're limited on space. You know, if you don't invite some guests over that maybe you don't like, you could put the door to the sukkah in the very back and say, hey, there's an extension out there if you'd like to. Um, maybe not. I don't think that's OSHA approved or, <laughs> but you know, you got to understand that. See, that's a commandment. Look, they're not making up excuses. Well, I don't have property in the yard. And look, at, well, look what they're doing. I like this next one. This is economical. <laughs> this is uh, made out of corrugated board. You know, corrugated board. You know, we say cardboard. You know, cardboard is what's back on notepad. Corrugated is like, you know, it's got, you know, little whatever. Spaces, vents. So here we go. We have, uh, actually, it's got, look at those two little, is that like the Eastern Gate version of sealed up? I built a sukkah, but you can't get in it. <laughs> All right, picture taken of a sukkah in the old city from the rampart. How about that? That was cool. Isn't that cool? That was really neat to, to go at Tabernacles and go on the rampart and see all the sukkahs and stuff. How many know what I'm talking about? Just incredible. And my first time in Israel was in 1997. It was Tabernacles. And then I did Tabernacles in 98. Or no, it was 90. Yeah, I want to say 96, 97, and 98. Yeah, did all three years of Tabernacles. So I got a good experience of that. And here's one near the Temple Mount. How about that? Me and Ted Harrell. Now, if you look closely, there's a guy sleeping on the table in there. He knows what a sukkah is for. He understands it. He is sleeping on that table. We had to stay outside. We don't want to bother the guy. So isn't that interesting? And how about decorating a sukkah? Some of you love to decorate. This is overkill probably, but it's a lot of decorations on that one, you know. And, and, and the cool thing about what the Jewish people have done with their families and their children, it's always hands-on, tasting, smelling, eating, experiencing, building, doing, you know, and, and that's what we, we've missed in, in, our, in our Christian church with our kids. They don't have a way of smelling and eating, experiencing and building things and doing things in the name of Jesus, you know what I mean? And here you have these things that you get to do. Does everybody see that? All right, Hosea 12, 9, here's a prophecy. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. Amen. Does everybody see that? Yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. Quick testimony, we're almost done here, but we had a, uh, we couldn't get a, a certificate of occupancy for our modular because certain things weren't done. So we had to put a tent up for tabernacles. And God showed me this verse, like, I got you now, sucker. <laughs> you got to build a tent. You got to live in a tent. You got to do the tent, you know. And I thought it was interesting how now we're all into tabernacles. You know, you know what I'm saying? Now we're all into booths and different things, you know. And it's just a temporary, you know, dwelling place, temporary little shelter. That's all it is. And, and here it is. He says, I will make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. Does everybody see that? That's why we're going back to tabernacles. 
All right, the Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated in the future. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. How many of you know that? Yes. Okay, here we go. Zechariah 14, 16 through 19. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Keep reading. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen? I share this with all my pastor friends, all my evangelical friends. Look, you're going to be celebrating. Oh, you don't want to celebrate? There's no rain. What does that mean? That means that God withholds the blessing. Is that what you want? No. He's saying they better come up. So we're rehearsing it. Isn't that the coolest thing? That is awesome. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering, Exodus 23.16 and Leviticus 23.39. It's the Feast of Ingathering. Exodus 23.16, let's read it. And the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Amen. Do you see that? It's the Feast of Ingathering, which is in the end of the year. Now, isn't that interesting? The end of the year with the agricultural year. The end of the year. Leviticus 23.39. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Amen? So the Feast of Ingathering. See, there's a vetting process happening right now. And, and, and the thing is, we have to remember what's going on here. There's a grassroots movement happening. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The Hebrews of the Christian faith movement is a legitimate movement, but it's been hijacked. There's been just problems with it. So we have come along. We have to fix it. Does everybody understand that? We have to fix this movement because we're ostracizing people. We're, put, we're bashing the church. We're doing this. No, the Hebrews of the Christian faith is to make everyone better. Amen. And this church is very respected among uh, the evangelicals and, and pastors and all pro-pastors and, and, and everything. And so we're, we're very much respected. Why? It's because we respect others. Amen. So the last little picture, little Micha. He was born during Tabernacles in 2004. No. No. Yeah, 2004. He'll be 15. So, see, he's okay. He's not in September. He's October 1st. That's when his birthday is. So, we're out of September. So, isn't that cool? So, here we have, uh, when we put the tent up, we have that giant sukkah. So... Uh, you know, it's about respecting the Lord and the fact of making his calendar your calendar. Your family's going to distract you. Work's going to distract you. All kinds of things are going to distract you at this time of year. But you only get one shot to rehearse the feast days in the fall. There's no makeups. Amen. So there's a lot of interesting things happening throughout the earth, I think, that are, I would say, mainstream. So in closing here, I, I want to just share this little story with you. I'm not going to get into uh, the Jerusalem Post actually had an article about Ha Yovel uh, because there was a campaign promise by uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he's going to make, uh, he's going to annex all of Judea and Samaria, annexation, you know, um, and we'll see. But actually the Jerusalem Post were interviewing Tommy Waller and Ha Yovel, and they of course responded in a positive light. I'm not going to read that story, but I want to read this one to you, which is, I thought was really, really cool. Uh, it's California Jewish legislators hang mezuzahs in symbolic move. Action uh, follows recent law barring landlords and homeowners from prohibiting tenants from affixing Jewish symbols to their door frames. 
So this actually was going on. You moved into an apartment, you moved to a condo. They say, you can't put this on your door because it goes against our code, our regulations, our rules. And they passed a a state law saying you can put a mezuzah up on your door. Come on, somebody. (laughs) California. How messed up is that? California State Senator Ben Allen, chair of the Jewish caucus, puts a mezuzah on his office door with Rabbi Mendy Cohen. Jewish state legislators in California hung mezuzahs on their office doors after returning from summer recess. During the recess, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill that bars landlords and homeowners associations from prohibiting their tenants from affixing mezuzahs to their doors and door frames. The legislators' Jewish caucus, which has 16 members, had lobbied hard for the measure. The bill was introduced following complaints from Jewish renters and condo owners who were told to remove their mezuzahs because of a building or apartment complex policy. Known to some as the mezuzah bill. (laughs) I'd like to make a motion for the mezuzah bill. It also had the support of secular organizations as well as Catholic and Hindu groups. Oh, thank you very much. Put it up. I mean, look, the Jewish caucus is a statement Monday made the announcement about the mezuzahs hung in Sacramento. Isn't that wonderful? What a feel-good story. Give yourself a hug. (laughs) So, Father, we thank you that the feast days are serious, but they're fun. And I pray right now, Father, that our hearts will be turned towards you, that you would make a way for us to to fulfill these feasts in a way of rehearsing them and, and just participating in them and enjoying them with each other. And uh, once again, we just thank you for Beit Tehillah. We thank you for everyone here. We thank you for those that give towards this vision to help us to build a strong community, raise the next generation in the gifts. And even those that are watching live streaming right now, we thank you for your uh, participation, being a part of the community online. We thank you for for your giving as well online and and just making uh, this vision come to pass because we are definitely an international ministry that we weren't really prepared for or didn't want but we know father now that you are using us to go international and so thank you for pastor russell and the media team and getting the message out and the word out father because your word will not come back null and void we ask this in the name of yeshua of nazareth amen praise the lord everybody